everybody, welcome back to another edition of PD and P Dubs Unscripted here with P Dubs. It's been a while. Ooh, man, has it ever been, PD? Yeah. It's a long time since we've been in the studio in the house. Yeah, it's been a couple more than a couple of months. Yeah. You know, life just kind of got crazy busy there, summer and start of the new school year. Well, plus all the uh, work we were doing on our re-campaign, which uh, took a lot of our time and investment, and it was all for a good purpose. But um, yeah, so hopefully now we can find ourselves back down here every now and again. Right, and that's something we wanted to share as we begin this episode, is kind of our future plans for the PD and P-Dubs Unscripted, because I know I felt a little guilty about not having new ones up there and feel bad because I know people were enjoying listening to it. But that three a week was quite a pace. That we it was a big workload, yeah, for it was sure. A big rote work work to find the time to record the three different episodes, then edit them, which thankfully it goes usually pretty smoothly editing the podcast. But then you know get them out, so that was a lot of time commitment, and the time just seemed to go quickly. Well, and getting in the studio, you know, being creative uh, three times a week is uh, is a high demand, and uh, you know having content that. Folks will hopefully, you know, still enjoy, you know, three times a week, even though there were many different topics. So, uh, yeah, we found that there was a bit of a load on that. Yeah. Right. So, you know, we kind of even said that initially, like, maybe we're buying off more than we can chew. <laughs> and, yeah, we that was the truth behind that. So our goal for 2023 is to do one episode a week. Yep. Yep. And uh, that certainly is manageable. And hopefully that'll be enough content for you all to enjoy and to look forward to. Um, and to tune in to us. So we, we have missed you, and uh, we hope that you'll return back and continue to be avid listeners. Right. So, you know, I haven't figured out what day I want the new episodes to drop, but maybe like a Wednesday, middle of the week. But we probably won't have an episode that first full week of January, January, the week at January 2nd, probably January 9th that week, like January 11th might be the first new episode, mm-hmm. just because I'm out of the office next week, and so yep, that would give sure. us time to record that first week of January sometime. But it is great to be back on the air, and I uh, hope that uh, you all have had a great 2022 second half, and right. uh, you know, as we're getting near to celebrate the Lord's birth, and the end of the closing out of this year. Right, so it's an exciting time as we get ready. I mean, today we're recording on December 22nd. We're just a couple days away from Christmas. You know, before we get to Christmas, we have Festivus coming up tomorrow, <laughs> which will probably be the day this comes out. So happy Festivus for those listening today. Are we going to air any grievances right here today on the show? I don't know. I don't uh, know if people want to hear any. any feats of strength. Oh, I got no feats of strength. No feats of strength. Um, we don't even have a poll in here. There, like, there's no, yeah, no there's Festivus poll. No Festivus poll. Man. But yeah, I got a lot of problems with you people. <laughs> You're going to hear about it. <laughs> oh, yeah. That's a that's a great show. I gotta. That's a good reminder. I gotta like watch that rerun. Yeah, I'll probably be pulling up the Festivus episode pretty soon yeah. tomorrow. Yep, for sure. And uh, yeah, so I don't know. Uh, we were kind of talking about you know memories of growing up and you know how Christmas was you know walked through in our various families, and so we thought maybe we could just take a walk down memory lane and. You know, maybe that'll spur up some good memories for you guys as well of like how as a child you used to spend Christmas or even growing up and even now, you know. So uh, it's really interesting how, you know, traditions are made in families, particularly around Christmas and uh, how they change as families change and develop and grow. Yep. So how about you? How did you... uh, you know, mm-hmm. when did you guys celebrate Christmas growing up? What day? So, yeah, usually Christmas, was like Christmas Eve, we'd go to my grandmother's house, have a big meal, then go to church at 7 p.m., and that was usually when the kids would act out the nativity scene, the typical mm-hmm. traditional mm-hmm. Christmas Eve worship, go back to Ma's house, open up presents there, and then go back home, and then Christmas Day, open up presents with my parents and my brothers, go to church, well, my mom and one of my brothers, or both my brothers, would help get mom ready for the house ready because we'd be hosting people. I remember always bringing the garbage bag to church on Christmas Day so we could bring home the poinsettia ah. because you can't let it get in the cold because they're no. not good in the cold weather. No, they are not. So that was always the responsibility to get the one of the poinsettias back home and 
for putting the garbage bag mm -hmm. and then come back home and then you know my mom's family dad's or more my dad's family then grandma also on mom's side would come over have christmas with that fam our family there and then everybody go home and so yeah we never i never went anywhere besides mom and dad's on christmas day yeah yeah same uh we were very similar too on christmas eve it was really basically our family and um you know, we we would open up gifts in the afternoon uh, after some time of, you know, snacks and goodies that my mom would always put out. She always, she'd call them nashis. And uh, anywhere from, like, shrimp to a cheese ball with crackers to uh, any kind of cookies. Uh, there was eggnog flowing, you know, and uh, old Mitch Miller records playing on the high five of Christmas songs. And, you know, we would... The Mitch Miller albums would have sheets that you could read and sing along with. So it was like, sing along with Mitch. So sometimes um, I remember being the youngest, I'd try and cajole the family, like, hey, we got to sing Christmas carols. And, you know, the older kids were not as willing. And so sometimes it worked, sometimes it didn't. And then uh, at some point, um, I think church would come. We'd go to church, and then we would come back and have our, our dinner after that, and then open gifts, and we wouldn't be done till like, midnight, and then there was somebody like, oh, let's go to the late service. Who's going? And yeah. some of us would go, some wouldn't. But, like, Christmas Day was kind of like what you described. We were more at home, but then, like, our grandparents would come over. Okay. And, or, like, uh, cousins or aunts and uncles. And uh, it was, as a kid... I never really knew who was all coming over. You know, you knew it was like grandma and grandpa, and uh, they'd come over for a time, and then like aunt and uncle from my dad's side. But it was kind of just low key, you know, uh, really, we weren't going anywhere. And yeah. so when the family members came over, all that I knew is I had to be in the house. You know, I couldn't yeah. be out playing with my new toys or whatever, sledding or anything oh. like that. So. But, yeah, it was kind of a low-key day. Right, and I think as you're talking about the Nashis, right, that's, mm -hmm. what, you know, that's what it kind of then became on Christmas Eve as we got older when we didn't have the big meal before going to church. You know, we had that. Like, we had the rye, these rye bread things with sausage on it. That's mm -hmm. one of my favorite things. You know, for people that like shrimp, there's always the shrimp, Chex Mix, and just crackers and those types of things. Yeah, yeah. And then, like, I even think of, like, when I would work at Jewel when I was in high school... And then or even college, when I would get done working at Jewel, usually I work till like 6, 6.30, which is the close. I'd always go to Grandma's house for a little bit then and just watch usually a Christmas story and just visit with Grandma before going to church. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, now that you say that, there were a couple of years where, like, as my grandparents were older, like, my grandma, both my grandmas lived in, a, in an elderly home. And so this was probably around when I was, like, 13-ish and... Um, by then, uh, probably both my siblings, my brothers were married and my sister lived in Colorado. We would then drive out to grandma's, both of them, on like Christmas Day. So uh, that kind of even changed as our family got older. So, right. um, and then like probably in the evening, maybe some friends or somebody would come over yeah. for a dinner. But yeah, um, now, well... Uh, you know, when Gwen and I had our own kids, uh, well, when we were first married, it was like spend the Christmas Eve at the Schilf house and then Christmas Day was at the Martin house. And then the Martin experience was like we'd start at her parents and then end up at her aunt and her aunt's house for dinner. Um, so there was a lot of driving, you know, going on. Right. And uh, so yeah, that's yeah. the way it goes. Right. And then now I'm thinking, you know, as an adult here, as pastor, like it's pretty much church service. Mm -hmm. Once we get done with whatever our kind of, bef the ser whatever service gets done before the 11 p.m. Because we've had the 7 in there. We've had the 5. Yeah. Usually I go to mom and dad's for a little bit. One of my brothers is there. And kind of the same type of hors d'oeuvres, nashis, as you like to say, yeah, yeah. would be at mom. Mom would make those and have those at mom and dad's. and. Uh -huh. Then run home for maybe a little bit and come back for the eleven p.m. and. Yep. Yeah. Once we become pastors, it's a different schedule for sure. And uh, you know, when we did have the seven o'clock, my cousin in Palatine would invite me over if I preached the seven and if I was going to do the seven and the eleven, they'd have me over for you know some 
things to eat and stuff like that, and then I would just stay in town right. till the eleven. And uh, but that made for that was a good time, but it kind of made for a long time. Right. But, um, a little break in between is not good or isn't right. so bad. Right, it's nice and. Mm-hmm. No, because I think of that year of COVID when we weren't necessarily getting as much together as a family, just going home, and I made my own rye bread and sausage right. things so I could have them. And but that was a quick turnaround because that's when we had the 7 o'clock. And I was like, oh, man, I'm just sitting down and getting comfortable. It's like, oh, got to get up and head back. Yeah. So I have to ask you on that rye bread and sausage thing, that sounds like a German thing. And it was it like raw meat? No. So, okay. so it is because I've made it, and... It is, you got the little rye breads, cocktail rye breads, and you take ground beef, Jimmy Dean hot sausage, okay, and then like some garlic powder and like oregano, mix it all together, cook that, then you take a pound of Velveeta, uh, Velveeta cheese, you melt that, so it's this cheesy goodness with it, and then you just put that in the on the rye breads, you usually make it in advance, so then once you make it and put it on the rye breads, you put it in the freezer... Then when it's time to eat it, you take them out of the freezer, put them in the oven at like 400, okay. and heat it all up. Okay, so it's it's cooked and everything. Yeah. Okay, because I remember my, my dad worked for a German company. They would have these rye bread things, and they called it pate. Or I don't know if they were trying to say like pate, but it was it was like uncooked ground beef, it seemed. And they were, eat that stuff up, and they're like, yeah, have some pate, have some pate. No thanks. No thanks. No, this was all cooked. Mm -hmm. It's got to be cooked in my book. Yeah, it's all cooked. Ground beef and Jimmy Dean hot sausage Mm -hmm. and seasonings and Velveeta cheese. How about on New Year's Eve or New Year's Day, did your mom have any special noshies that were indicative of the new year? No, we kind of did those little rye bread things. Those are are a go-to. Okay, so my mom would make, like, she would put out herring. And so, like, I guess herring is a big New Year's thing, like, as a as something to eat going into the New Year. And my oldest brother, Vern, he loved herring. Oh, I would just can't stand it, you know? Yeah. Like, how do you eat that stuff? Yeah, I was like, those, and, like, we'd have, like, pizza rolls and watch just movies with Mom and Dad on us three. And mm-hmm. the special treat was always New Year's Day, because Dad would make omelets on New Year's Day Ooh. for breakfast. And, and so, you must have made good ones. Yeah, they were good. Like, that was always the goat. That was, like, the main breakfast Dad would always make would be omelets. And uh-huh. it was always New Year's Day, home from the firehouse. And so that's what I always thought of on New Year's Day was omelets. Cool. But I, I, I don't know if I've, I haven't made omelets myself for a while. I enjoy making omelets, you know, and uh, throwing in different kind of ingredients. Ingredients, yep. Yeah. Um, uh, back to Christmas when, you know, you're opening presents. What one memory, uh, a particular present that you didn't expect that you got that made you, like, super joyful? I see, I'm trying to think. Like, it's hard to think back to that. Mm-hmm. Like, I mean, like I've said in the past, like, I always enjoyed, like, Nin- trains. Train, my Brio, and, like, my Ninja Turtles and Ghostbusters. I mean, I'm trying to think, like, because I was older with the video game systems, and that was usually never a surprise, because I was usually one who would, like, okay, I'm going to go get the new system. and yeah. But I'm just trying to think here, like, as I'm thinking, and if I can think of something, what about you? Well, for me, it was this thing called Johnny Lightning Racing Set. Okay. And um, I don't remember asking for it. I must have, because, like, it came in a big box. And I remember opening it, and I saw that it was Johnny Lightning. And I was, like, ecstatic. And it was this kind of racetrack that... Um, in order to want to get the cars going, they would like the bottom would hook on some clip that you know, like on um, roller coaster rides where you go straight up, do, 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 go up, and then they mm-hmm. have you go down. Well, it was kind of this um, incline, and you had this oh, like uh, a handle that you slid real fast along the bottom, and that would launch the car into the track, up this incline, and around the track, and then, and then it would come back down, and you'd, like, launch it again, and launch it again, and launch it again, and it was side by side. So, like, you could have races. Like, you and I could have races, and, like, keeping our cars going, and, like, I think there was some sparks or something, Johnny Lightning, you know? I can't remember. But 
I was like over the moon mm. excited. Like I can't believe I got Johnny Lightning. And I don't know. I don't even. Maybe you could Google that it's, if it even shows up anymore. Like, but it was like one of those toys that just um, was. I didn't expect it, and mom and dad got it for me. Another one was the Lionel race. Uh, the Lionel Power Passers car racing set. So you. You're kind of yeah. getting that I yeah. loved race yeah. cars. So, um, so, is that kind of what you're talking about? Yes, that's it. I mean, I know Johnny Lightning's still a thing now because I know this is it right there. There's that incline thing. This okay. This is making for great podcasting right now because everybody yeah, can see what like, oh, can't see they it. can see what we're talking about. But okay, but I know Johnny Lightning still makes cars now today that you can buy. Do they? Yeah, because I know like. My dad collects some of that stuff and then gets stuff for my nephew. Like, there's a lot of Johnny Lightning stuff. And I, I, I think if there's a Ecto-1 that I have, is, which is a Ghostbusters car, if I have that as a Johnny Lightning, I might. Because you had to have, the, the, you had to have a Johnny Lightning car to fit on this device. Because, like, you couldn't just bring your Hot Wheel cars into this. It just wouldn't work. Because um, it had to grab onto this, this thing that you were shooting it up the ramp. Okay, yeah. So, yeah, I do have a Johnny Lightning thing because I just looked it up here. They do have, I believe this is what I have, something similar to this. But, yeah, so see, like, there's, like, I have that, like, Ecto-1 oh, Johnny yeah. Lightning. Okay, gotcha. Where, so, you know, All like, right, Ecto-1 so from the go- second Ghostbusters I movie. I had no idea they even kept going out oh. of the 70s. Oh, they are still around, my friend. Man, oh, man. All right, this is it. I'm going to go online and see if I can buy... My old Johnny Lightning said it. There's got to be somebody out there. What was it called? Like, tra- let's see. I don't know. Johnny Lightning Racing set. I, I don't know. That's all I remember. I'm just trying to look it up here on eBay. <laughs> but, yeah, but the uh, Lionel Power Passers was cool because, you know, back in the day, slotted race cars was the thing. But the Lionel Power Passers was slotless. And, like, what you could do is if you were, like, behind somebody, you could press the button on your controller and it would move out and pass them on the yeah. side. And, man, that was so cool. But, unfortunately, that racetrack didn't last very long. So, I did find on eBay Johnny Lightning racetrack accessories loop-to-loop, Ooh. 40 bucks. Ooh, loop-to-loop. I don't remember the loop-to-loop. That looks more like, like a Hot Wheels thing. But it's but Johnny Lightning. Yeah, wow. And that box looks a little older there. Uh-huh. Oh, speaking of Hot Wheels, I was watching uh, Everybody Loves Raymond, and uh, apparently Raymond got the Hot Wheels uh, dragster track. Okay. Uh, for his for a gift, and uh, apparently the he had his dad's records by uh, where he put the the ramp, and so the story went that Ray moved Frank's records over by the furnace and melted them all. Uh, and so the story goes that Ray got the blame for 30 years, but it was really Robert who um, did it. Did it because he was uh, jealous that Raymond got his his racetrack set while Robert got corrective shoes. <laughs> so, so it was a great episode where you know it just came to light like 30 years later. He's like, you, you melted the records. And he's like, get over it. I did find this Johnny Lightning 500 Cyclone track with box Ooh. used for 100 bucks. Oh. That that might be worth looking into. So, you know. Alright, that kind of, I remember the black track. So, yeah. you know, don't be bidding out on Pastor on this one, people, on eBay. <laughs> you know. But yeah, so as you kind of talk about toys, I'm almost thinking, I don't know if it was a Christmas, but I remember having and really enjoying it. But I do remember I had like a fake proton pack for the Ghostbusters Ooh, cool. with also the Trapper Keeper. So I remember like walking down my parents' stairs at times, <laughs> like I was a Ghostbuster and be like, there's a ghost. And then throwing the Trapper Keeper and like, and using the the, little gu- the the proton pack to get the ghost to get them in the Trapper Keeper. Oh, that's funny. I don't know if that was a Christmas, but I know I had it. And like, and I think like the Trapper Keeper thing broke because like the little core that you would step on to then the air would push it open yeah. they got a little cut in the little core in the yeah. tubing so then it wouldn't open up anymore oh that's funny but yeah i mean like i said ghostbuster ninja turtles i was good with mm-hmm. and same with my brio train sets which i still have at mom and dad's in pristine condition in the original packaging oh that's key 
I mean, it's so, a collector's item. And now I see Brio and I'm like, it looks a lot cheaper now. It's more oh, plasticky. Of course. They're yeah. plasticky cars, just not the same quality. I had the I had the Lionel train set, and they were they were bigger and metallic, and especially the engines, they were really cool. The cars were getting kind of plastic at the end, but they used to be they used to be metal. I had an older, like probably a '60s version of the oh. Lionel train set, and then I got one in the '70s, and like all the cars behind it were getting plasticky looking. But yeah, it was still pretty quality plastic, but. Not, not like today. Not the same. Oh, man, a real wooden train set complete inbox vintage, which would be what I would have had. 96 bucks. That's not bad. No, no, that box looks more beat up than what I bet mine is. And $23 for shipping and handling, though. Oh, forget it. That's, yeah. that's too much. <laughs> too much. <laughs> yeah, oh, good old Christmas. It's no wonder, you know, we uh, we have such fond memories of family and you know, uh, activities that we did and the, and the times, uh, the gifts that we got. But as we both shared uh, in our families growing up, going to church on that was Christmas important. Eve and Christmas Day was an important thing. Right, because that's kind of what it's all about, the it season. Really is, yeah. I mean, it's nice to get the toys, especially as a kid, you're focused on those things, because I'm sure as a kid you weren't always ex- as excited to go to church on mm-hmm. Christmas Eve or Christmas Day, because I'm thinking Christmas Day, I wasn't really motivated, because especially if you got a new video game exactly. or a new toy, it's like, oh, I want to play with this. I know. I don't want to go to church. Uh-huh. But now, well, yeah, you can't, as an adult, I'm like, nope, it's all about Jesus. That's right. Yeah. So uh, so that was always a big part of it. And, uh, you know, uh, obviously I've been at Emmanuel my whole life, so like, I do always remember, you know, the, the lights going down, singing Silent Night. I can't remember if we always held candles. I can't remember that as a kid. Um, but I do remember that we did have a Christmas Day service always. And so that that was always kind of up in the air. I think most times we went on Christmas Day because our Christmas Eve went so late into the night. Yeah. And um, so that was not everybody was going. Because it's based upon their energy level or getting up or whatever, but um, but yeah, always included worshiping the Lord and um, and so that was something that uh, we thought we'd just jump into some of the stories scripturally of uh, Jesus' birth and the narratives in Matthew and if we have a little bit of time, maybe jump into the Luke text a little bit and uh, so yeah, we just heard last week the. The birth of Jesus as told by Matthew in our normal readings, uh, fourth weekend of Advent. And uh, so this one really just kind of puts us into, um, like as I shared last weekend, kind of a a real real problem, a real worldly problem of, you know, Joseph finding out that Mary's um, pregnant and he's not the father. So it's like... Oh, what is going on? Here? Right, you know, she cheated on me, mm-hmm. you know, and here we're be married, and right. now right. she's not faithful. And so you could understand, like, his concern, but also what a respectable person was, that he didn't want to cause any shame upon uh, Mary, and so he was going to divorce her quietly, and somebody's like, well, how would have he done that? I know, I was thinking of that too, like, because as I said, you know, Nazareth is a small little town, and so people are going to know, like, after, you know, she begins to show. I mean, maybe in their clothing they could kind of... Or did they do, oh, you're going to go see Aunt So-and-so and send her off and well, not... Which she did. She went to go see Elizabeth, right. remember? That's and, right. And uh, she spent some time in the hill country. Um, right. So, like, yeah, there... I suppose just about now, you know, even in our times, there are... There are unplanned pregnancies of younger women, maybe in high school, that families have to deal with, and they have to like, how do we how do we keep this you know under wraps under or... wraps until we're ready to share you know, share or you know it's like you have no choice after a while right you know, if you're and uh, so yeah I, I'm sure there was a lot of that and I, I thought the same thing like. <laughs> How is he going to do this quietly? Because, like, okay, he divorces her, and she then has said baby. Well, is Joseph the father? Oh, no, the, well, you committed adultery then. Mm-hmm. So now you're going to receive the punishment of adultery. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so, and that punishment, according to, you know, Levitical law, was you know, she could be stoned. Right. And so, I mean, 
So it would have taken coordination between Mary's parents or family and Joseph's um, because there was already an arrangement or an agreement that was kind of contractual in nature with the betrothal. Because that that really, in the eyes of the law back then, if you're betrothed, you're you're already married, and um, and so even in verse nineteen it says, "And her husband Joseph, being a just man and unwilling to put her to shame, resolved to divorce her quietly." Well, that word "husband" shows that that yeah. that betrothal. Is in effect you're already married. It's just yeah. waiting to do the marriage celebration, right? Because right, according to like the Lutheran Study Bible, it says you know according to Jewish custom, betrothal, betro- 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 I don't know why I couldn't say it there, <laughs> was a legally binding relationship. The first stage of marriage, mm-hmm. because so. they're the family. Like I think Joseph's family would have paid what was mm, called the, the bride pr- price uh, to Mary's family. Uh, to like, okay, this this executes the contractual re- nature of the relationship, right. right? Which is just funny when you think about what marriage is supposed to be. It's right. a, it's a contract. Yeah, exactly. And right. the fact that you know, well, Joseph certainly must have had feelings for her because, as you right. said, Pastor, he wanted to do you know something that wouldn't cause her shame, right? Which is really marvelous on his in his point. I've always wondered, like, how much older Joseph was than Mary. I mean, right. we always hear Mary might have been, like, a 14. younger teen, like 13, 14, 15, or whatever. Like, how old was Joseph? Was he in his 20s? Right. Was you he know, 18, early? 19? Yeah, right? Um, so, because he, you know, it's he's he's deemed a man, being a just man, as opposed to, like... A just boy. Boy, you know. So, he must have been of the age... To be into adulthood, right? Which I don't. Back then, would that have been eighteen? I don't. You know, sixteen. Uh, who knows? I don't know. But um. But yeah, so he's really faced with this predicament, and because uh, then even like you know, if Mary's like, "Hey, this is what happened. You know, don't worry, I didn't cheat on you. It's this miracle of God." Like it's a it's uh, a hard thing to Joseph would have been like. What, 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 no, no. Yeah. Like, it just seems unpos- impossible that that would be the case. Yeah, yeah, it, it'd be like, well, all right, I'm a God-fearing man, I believe in God, but, but really, you're, I, you're, I know you're a woman of faith, you're a young woman of faith, but really? Come you, on You think now. I'm that stupid, yeah, I'm going to fall mean, for that? Exactly. So, I I totally get it. And uh, but there was a lot at stake here, you know, just without the fact that this is the the son of God, you know, who is going to be born. Sure. And uh, so, um, you know, at, and he's considering this, these things. And then uh, Matthew uses a very Lucan word, behold, and uh, it's like here's where the angel appears to Joseph in a dream. And, um, well, speaking of Joseph and dreams, uh, as you were kind of talking, we were kind of preparing for this, um, Matthew, the author, is writing to a Jewish audience, right? Right, that's his intended audience, so he writes it towards them and their understanding, and that's what you're getting at here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because there was another Joseph who was certainly seen to be a righteous man, righteous and just. Righteous dude, I prefer. Righteous dude. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, that old uh, um, yeah. that old quote from mm, uh, Ferris Bueller. Ferris Bueller, which we just were talking about yeah, too exactly, upstairs. Exactly. So he was a righteous man. So uh, just as Joseph in Egypt was a righteous man, um, God came to him in dreams, uh, kind of told him the future, which he shared and acted upon. Here, uh, Joseph. Uh, is also approached by God by a revelation in an angel in a dream and um, has a message for him about the future and right. what he should do. So uh, in, that, in that way that Matthew is writing to the, to the Jewish audience, um, even the message that the angel says, that she will bear a son and shall call his name Jesus, that phrase has been used by angels in the Old Testament to women who have borne out, you know, like 
I think uh, Sarah had that language said to her. Hagar, we were talking about, had that language. And he said Hannah. And Hannah. And so there's a lot of like connecting points for the Jewish audience who's reading this from Matthew to kind of go back to the Old Testament and say, okay, this is not something completely out of the realm of God to do. Right, saying, hey, I see what you're doing here. I see the connecting points. Mm -hmm. It's kind of like... A little off subject, but the TV show Arrested Development with uh, Jason Bateman, Ron Howard did it. It was a comedy, but throughout that show, they'll make a reference in something in season one and then pull back to it in season three. Mm. And it's just a little like subtle things like that you see throughout like, wait a second, I see where that's playing out or what's going on. Yeah. That it's just like the little like, hey, I get what's going on. And like when you pay attention, like that's really well written because you're like, I see how this connects or what they're doing here. Those little inside jokes, which other shows have that too. Like I know, I know we're both big Seinfeld fans. There's different things where you can find videos on YouTube. Like see like how they pull back to something later on in the show. Well, I wonder, you know, I kind of joke that, oh, this is a very Lucan word, behold, in Greek, kaiadu, whatever. And uh, so Luke likes to use that word a lot. But maybe that's why Matthew put this in here. Like, hey, you know, call to mind. Behold. Hey, looky think, here. Look here. Think back. You've seen this kind of thing before. A uh, messenger, an angel, talking to a woman who's about ready to be a child. And now, you know, it's he's doing it to Joseph. You know? right. And so, yeah, so um, the, the angel lays it all out. You know, it calls him Joseph and that he too is the son of David. He is part of this messianic line. Maybe it's a reminder of his role uh, in this situation right? Uh, that the Messiah has to come from the house and the line of David. And right. um, so don't fear. Don't fear. You know, this is, you're part of this story. Which is another common saying for an angel is do not be afraid, do mm-hmm. not fear. Mm-hmm. Yeah, this is, this is all part of the plan. And don't fear to take Mary as your wife. Uh, for that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. Um, I was listening to another commentator saying that that word take in the rest of this, um, anytime it talks about Joseph in the early parts of Matthew, like, uh, so don't be afraid to take Mary as his wife. And then later on in the text it says, he took her to be his wife. And then... When it was time after the baby was born, the angel came back to Joseph and said, get up, take the child and the wife to Egypt. So there's that take, and then it says, he took them to Egypt. And then when they're in Egypt, it's like he wakes them up in a dream, take the child back to Nazareth and with the wife. And so he took. So the whole thing is that Joseph is told to do certain things, and he acts upon it in faith, and he does that so that... Uh, like the commentator called him Joseph, like he's the he's the the taker of things, you mm. know, and he 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 carries out in obedience that which God commanded him to do, and so you see his faith in that, right? And even that, like, you know, I like think of my own dreams. Like, if I saw something in a dream, mm-hmm. I would be like, well, "That was some crazy dream." Right? I wouldn't think, "Okay, that's what I'm going to do." Mm-hmm. But that faith that Joseph had, that hearing the dream, and I guess. Maybe it's something I could never imagine because I've never had an angel speak to me in a dream. Right. But how do you know it's just not your mind thinking something crazy in your dreams mm-hmm. or that, no, this is really from God? Well, it's like, you know, uh, um, in It's a Wonderful Life, you know, mm. George Bailey, you know, he's got Clarence the Angel. He's like, what? <laughs> You're an angel? You know, like, right. I must have had too, too much Session. strong drink or something like this. So, yeah, we would be the same way. It's like, really? Did I... Yeah. Did I really dream that? Or is that what I'm supposed to do? Or if you're like me, you don't remember your dreams? Yeah. Sometimes, isn't that weird? Sometimes I can really remember every detail about my dreams, usually when I just wake up out of them. Uh, but then there's times where it's like, oh, I remember I was dreaming about this or that, but then I get foggy on the details. Right. Yeah, so. it's crazy how the brain works there. Mm-hmm. But here we see that faith coming out in Joseph of just being like, okay. This is the plan, and you even look at, like, Joseph in the Old Testament and, like, having that faith in God where, like, what was going through his mind when his brother sold him into slavery? 
even though he knew like his dreams, what they said, thinking, okay, God, where, where, where are they going to bow down to me? They, yeah. they just sold me. I'm probably never going to see them again. Mm-hmm. Then, you know, things go good. Then Potiphar's wife happens, and then he flees, mm-hmm. and then he gets falsely accused and wrongly sentenced. Yep. And there's a, I, can't, I always can't remember off the top. The cupbearer and the, the, oh. the baker, I forgot which one forgets them. Is it the cupbearer that forgets them? Uh, maybe, yeah. One of them forgets, like, oh, don't worry, Joseph, I'm going to remember you. Yeah. And then two years later, he's like, oh, yeah, I got this Joseph guy you remember in prison. He can interpret your dream. Yeah, yeah. But, like, the faith that Joseph had to have of, like... How many I'm, years would he have been in prison, right? Right, but being sold into slavery, mm-hmm. then working his way out of that to just be thrown into prison because of a false accusation. Yeah. Somebody tell you, hey, don't worry, I got you back. Mm-hmm. That person then waits two years. Right. And you still have the faith to, you know... Trust in the Lord in these things, and even like um, you know, he's in he's his life is in danger, just as Joseph's life was in danger. You know, like get up, get go. You know, because um, you know uh, the baby's life is in danger. Go to Egypt and so forth. So, so yeah, he is acting on faith, um, and he tells him that the reason why this child is so special. Uh, and how to name Jesus, or how to name the child Jesus, and the meaning of that in verse 21, for he will save his people from their sins. So right away, Matthew is sharing the whole purpose of why this uh, Christ child is being born, and um, and that it is fulfilling prophecy and, he, and he prophecy, and he ties it back to the Isaiah 7 text. Right, and so that's that other idea of like just how well connected the Bible really is, as we've been talking about. Mm-hmm. Yeah, uh, virgin shall conceive and bear a son, call his name Emmanuel, and uh, it's lifting from Isaiah seven verses seven through ten, and th- there have been a lot of like uh, commentary on that word virgin in um, the Old Testament, and um, and I think that Hebrew word is Alma which could mean uh, a woman uh, of capable of having birth, like in the age of birth. Like the air, yeah. And, but it also could mean uh, virgin. And as, I don't know, I don't know if you learned, but I learned, uh, Hebrew is all about context, you know, which, which thing you're going towards. But the fact that um, when the Septuagint came out, which is a Greek version of the Old Testament, they used the same word in Greek, uh, for that Isaiah text under virgin as they are right now, which is Parthenos, and it means virgin. So there's there's like that really strong tie that, um, you know, what Isaiah was saying, or God was saying through Isaiah, is a virgin. You know, right. it's a virgin who will conceive and bear a son. Now, you know, it's like any prophecy. The prophecy was for King Ahaz in his time, but it's also for something yet to come. Right. You know, so, obviously, uh, if there was a virgin who conceived and bare a son, it didn't happen in uh, King Ahaz's time, because there was another child born uh, yeah. whose name had to do with, uh, to the victor goes the spoils kinds of thing, is the name. But it wasn't the name Emmanuel. So, it didn't mean that uh, there wasn't yet a Messiah to come, and so here he is. Right, and that kind of reminds me, as you said, Emmanuel there, and his name, like, you know, I remember one of our members come out on Sunday and be like, you know, it says his name is going to be Emmanuel, but other size it says it's going to be Jesus. Yeah. And like, well, what's what's the deal with that? Uh-huh. Like, I think it's just the different ways of how to say it, what Jesus' name is, and like, you know, we kind of joked about, you know, I was like, wait a second, his last name isn't the Christ? <laughs> yeah, right. But it's just, I think it's just the audience that they're hitting upon. And mm-hmm. when you think about Jesus means what Jesus saves or God saves. Yep. And God with us, both are... They're very synonymous, right. you know. It's like um, just other ways to describe to describe the Lord. And, um, and uh, so, yeah, it's... Uh, it is something that I could see people getting hung up on, but is is the naming uh, from the angel is um, Jesus, you know? And there's two. I wondered if, especially with like 
Old Testament connection here. A lot of times the Old Testament, the name of the person had to do with something about that person. Mm -hmm. You know, like Esau, red and hairy. He had red, he was red hair. Right. And so, you know, is that a descriptor? So is this just another descriptor of who Jesus is in a sense that the names are almost act as descriptor and it just becomes a name? Yeah, I think I think that's part of it as well. So, and and certainly Emmanuel, um, the word L E L is God, and then Emanu is God with, and so I mean with us is Emanu is with us, so it's kind of like with us God, right? And uh, so we we just and that's that exactly what he is, God with us. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so it really uh, solidifies that he's not just a child that will save us from our sins, but he is he is God, right. uh, which is really important because through the times of history and even now, people question if Jesus really is true he says God. That. Right. Or is he just a man who has divine right. Or does power. good things and different things like that. Yeah. So, um, so yeah, there's a lot to, to come from the naming. And um, so as you see in verse 24, Joseph woke up. It says he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. And I think that's a good word to focus in on is like the Lord does command and he obeys. So there it is. He took his wife, but uh, knew or not, didn't get intimate with her until she had given birth to a son. And they called and they called his name Jesus. And uh, so, yeah, um, that's uh, that's really shows you know, the faith of Joseph as a stepfather role. Right. And uh, you know that he mm-hmm. took Jesus under his wing as he r- taught him, him and as a carpenter, him. being mm-hmm. a carpenter. Yep. Yeah, I wish, you know, there's sometimes some folks in the Bible I wish you could learn more about right. like, later on afterwards. They don't get much about this Joseph. No, not at all. So... Um, so yeah, so that's uh, that's one aspect of the story, and uh, and you know I, I was thinking about it how I said you know the Luke text is real poetic, beautiful, and you know we we could almost say it by heart because we hear it all the time, but it, there's even some messiness in that one too, right? Yeah. Like, um, you know, just that uh, the whole town of Bethlehem was crowded because of the census and. Uh, so as they came to the family house, it was crowded with family members, so there was no room in the inn, which um, is a particular word in the Greek that means like guest room, right. and uh, that's where we find out later that Jesus had uh, the upper room, was like the guest room of a house. So there's people, there's, there's family members already there loading up the, the guest room, and, so and they had to go somewhere else. And you know, on top of that, like traveling while pregnant mm, mm-hmm. in that day and age, like, because I'll share it, you know, I have it in my message for Christmas Eve, like, when I was looking about, like, the distance, you know, they're about 90 miles apart. I was just going to ask you, like, um, how, how long that was. So, yeah, so spoiler for Christmas Eve sermon, you know, when I did a map quest on Google, like, how long would it take you to walk from Bethlehem to Nazareth, or Nazareth to Bethlehem? Mm-hmm. 32 hour walk. Woo! And, you know. That's, what, that's probably straight through. Straight through. Right. And think of the heat in the Middle East and being nine months pregnant. And I, I'll imagine that there are, you know, areas where there were like robbers or bandits right. that would kind of, it was probably sketchy to go through various corridors. So at least a two to three day walk at least. Mm-hmm. And I wonder, did they. You know, you always see the portrayal of just them alone on the donkey. Right. And uh, throw a little Shrek, uh, <laughs> Shrek blood, donkey, and uh, whatever. But you always see the, the portrayal of them alone. Now, if people are coming to Bethlehem for the census, you think the families would... Travel like together, caravan, like because because that seems to be the way. Because like you look at when Jesus gets left at the temple, mm-hmm. they're in a caravan kind of coming back. Because that's why they left him because they thought he was with somebody Some else. Their relatives, right? And uh, so I, I don't know. I um, I I wonder. You know, that's often portrayed in that way, and mm-hmm. I don't think that's scriptural. No. It just and has the, their name. And like, the thing is, like, if they are traveling a group, 
with anything like traveling with a group even here in 2022, it takes a whole lot longer traveling in a group because you have longer breaks, longer stops. You got to stop for bathroom breaks. Like even, mm. you know, like some people got to go to the bathroom, some don't. Mm. Oh, then mm. now someone's hungry. Uh, yeah. Then someone Not has everyone's on the same schedule. Something to drink. And like, yeah, that's, that takes time. So, but yeah, I was just saying, I was like, man, I couldn't imagine what it would be like that walk in that heat. Yep. And just... Or even riding the donkey. I'm sure that's not good for the baby in the womb, the bouncing up and down on the right. donkey. Because she was great with child. So, so um, yeah, that, that must have been really difficult. And uh, But, uh, again, well, it shows that they're both, Mary and Joseph, are, you know, really God-believing people who are living their life in accordance uh, with following Him. You know, certainly they're going... For the, uh, for the census, but later on, as you pointed out, when they came to the temple, that was another trip, and then like you know, moving, coming back probably for uh, sa- uh, Sabbath or Passover or things like that. Uh, they did these customs, you know, right. so they were very attuned to living their daily life to how God had outlined it for them as Jewish believers, right? Right. And so, uh, yeah, so it starts out, uh, in those days, a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered or taxed. And this was the first one since, all right, how do you say this word? Is it Quirinius or? Quirinius? 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 I always say Quirinius. Quirinius? I don't even know. Quirinius or Quirinius. Yeah, I'm not exactly sure how you do the Quirinius, and I just pretend to say things like I know what I'm talking about in the Bible, and nobody questions it. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, uh, it's a beautiful story that we're all very familiar with, you know, and it shows how they came to Bethlehem. There was no place for them to stay. Um, you know, it's, it's not like they're going, there's no room in the Motel 6. It just was the uh, family house where it was just full, and so they went kind of in the back basement area where all the cattle and animals were and there they are in a very humble area and uh, then as we know the shepherds appearing uh, the angels Angel appearing King. to the shepherds and and them acting on faith to come and see and then seeing and spreading the news and it's beautiful right and, and in the end you see Mary just taking a pause of the moment pondering these and holding them into her heart right. you know like something absolutely amazing happened and that's exactly what it is because you have god in flesh coming there mm-hmm. and you know and that's what we're going to be talking about this weekend here on church yeah we don't want to blow it you know so uh both pastor and i have some messages to give and so uh we hope that if uh you have nowhere to go for worship that you would come to emmanuel uh we're at 200 north plum grove road in palatine illinois uh, if you're out of town, check us out on our website, uh, manualpalatine.org. Yeah, services will be December 24th at 3, 5, and 11 p.m., and then on Christmas Day at 10 a.m. Yeah, so hopefully you can join us, and we wish you all a most blessed and joyful Christmas. Mm-hmm.